Hi, everybody. Welcome to this month's um, AI application packaging expert roundtable. I think we got another good one for you. Um, just a few housekeeping. Um, everyone is muted for the entire session. Um, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A uh, window. Uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have, and we'll go through as many as we can, and we'll have the answers to all the questions that we answer uh, posted in another week or two in our uh, Flexera community. Um, and we'll also, a day or two later, we'll have a video of this. So if you want to share that among others or rewatch it, you can do that too. All right, these are today's speakers. Um, Karen, I'll let you go first. Yep. <clears throat> Karen Monkey, Senior Product Manager for Admin Studio at Luxora. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I'm Michael Connor. I'm a senior solutions engineer and, covering uh, Admin Studio and some of our other solutions. Go ahead, Jeroen. Yeah, hi. My name is Jeroen Black. I'm uh, based out of the Netherlands, uh, account manager for the security products as well um, as a domain expert in packaging. Okay. And uh, um, the uh, guest today like we have to is. Take just a second. Hi guys, this is just an intro from me. So uh, my name is Christopher Luxton. I run a, a company based out of the UK, but working around the world on uh, everything app packaging. And uh, I've been in this space for nearly 25 years, so it's a great series. Welcome. All right, so uh, before we uh, want to get started, we want to first take uh, ask a question of the audience that we have. So. Um, so the question is, when it comes to updating applications in your environment, what what is, and obviously there's always going to be different, you know, drivers for different use cases and so forth, but what would you say on average or what's kind of the primary driver? So is it application owners that are asking you to uh, update applications? Um, uh, you know, different vendor events, you know, you subscribe to notifications and emails you get from vendors telling you there's new versions or there's a security <laughs> uh, notice that to, to update. Um, is it their end users asking for updates uh, that they want, you know, the new features and capabilities, uh, security, you know, telling, uh, telling you to update, or is there just kind of a general organizational policy that says, no, we're always, you know, the current release or an N minus one type of thing. So obviously they can all play a part uh, in any organization, but what would you say would be the majority uh, driver for for your organization? So we'll give you a few moments to uh, select one. And if you have any other ones, if there's ones we don't have on this list, you'll feel free to choose option F and then you can throw that in the Q&A. Yeah, I think Mike, they're, they're, they're good. It's a great start to that, right? Because like you say, there's probably going to be two or three main drivers. Sure. It'd be really great to understand how this has changed. Because if we asked people 10 years ago, it'd be very different to how it is today. You know, I think it's um, it's going to be very interesting. And I think that will help us just as we talk through the discussions. Yeah. All right. In, in many cases, I would imagine it's it's mix of multiple reasons, but again, mm -hmm. here here I think we are interested in the in the, in the majority or the primary driver, right, Mike? Right. All right, we'll give a few extra seconds, let's see. folks. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's go and see. All right. So mm -hmm. interesting. So we got a. Uh, a different, I'm not sure how the poll <laughs> worked. I think that's a, uh, a cumulative out of a hundred, yeah. but, uh, at the very least we can see some, some popular options is application owners asking for updates as well as, uh, security teams push that, but that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that, that, and that follows what, what we see Mike with our clients here, you know, at Tlux where whenever we start and we'll, we'll go into some detail. A little later but we always ask you know what is driving your your project whatever that is you know yep cool all right well uh chrisman you know as and 
people missed it or didn't come through. So you're a um, you're one of our um, best partners around application readiness and packaging and preparation of applications. So when it comes to um, you know managing all those applications, what do you what do you guys suggest and see in the see in the market? Yeah. So as I was just saying in the introduction, there we've been involved in packaging you know, pretty much since it kind of started. In fact, before a lot of the platforms and the technology we're now used to using even existed. So you know, back in the old days when you had to wire things together and make MSI yourself and do testing manually and all that kind of stuff. So the world's changed a lot. And what really is now considered the, the heart of any project is the application repository. And it'll have different titles. It could be a software repository. Um, but really, this is the heart of the project in terms of what are the products, applications, packages, right? They're all different words for the same thing. How they manage in your organization. How do you have visibility on what you've got and what you don't have? And really, how is it maintained? Because these projects have moved from being a point solution of going, you know, let's migrate to Windows XP, right? Back in the early 2000s, or let's migrate to Windows 7, you know, several years ago now, it's moved to a, a live, fluid business transformation process. And because of that, this core app repository really is, is, is at the heart of it. And so there's four main kind of considerations here as to how do we ensure this is fit for purpose? How is it useful to the business? How is it secure? How do we manage it, right? And words like responsibility, you know? <laughs> and, and, and lastly, future-proofing. How do we make sure we're using it properly and we don't have to scrap it in two years' time and redo it again? You know, because that's not good for whatever you do. So we see the, the four main influencers around the corporate environment. So whether you're talking licensing, whether you're talking any kind of M&A activity, because of course businesses buy businesses all the time. And so there's always a, an overlap of not just policies and processes, but an overlap of tool sets, products, um, and, and software. Um, but actually on that corporate changes angle, Probably one of the most important, which we'll come into later, is the cadence of business transformation. So, you know, we all joke that there's updates for Microsoft every day, right? There will, will be, but what do we do with them? You know, as a home user, we might want to have the latest and greatest all the time, but that's not practical in the business world. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll never stop updating your corporate platform. And how do you check what those updates are for vulnerabilities, for security issues, for compatibility and all that kind of stuff? So the corporate changes is, is, is very important. Brisbane, we... uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, you, you mentioned virtualization. So I'm, I'm curious to know when you say virtualization, do you mean app virtualization? And if yes, then uh, have you seen uh, any decline with respect to app virtualization? Let's say it's it's because of MSIX, because I think MSIX mm. is the next thing and, and, it, yeah. and it almost operates like a virtual application within a container. Yeah. And uh, and AppFree, I think, is, is going end of life in a couple of hours, a couple of years. Mm. So yeah. by virtualization, do you mean app virtualization? And, and what's your experience these days? Are, yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. Are, are companies or organizations still looking at app virtualization? Yeah, good question. Um, and again, app app exactly. It, it's mainly around that virtualization because platform virtualization is really a non-issue because it's just a platform. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, again, if we go back, mm -hmm. one of our slides later is all about the, the lessons learned from being in this app packaging world for, for two and a half decades. But in terms of app virtualization, you know, there's there's many different me mechanisms and methods out there, um, but they all kind of do the same thing, right? They all make it easier to deploy, to undeploy, to manage, to maintain, and to protect a piece of software or an app in the business world. We we don't see a massive change in the way people handle virtualization. It's it's not a majority of apps, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably a 20, 25% of apps that are now considered yeah. to be virtualized. And yes. I, I would agree, right? And I don't think that's changed. I mean, I think, you know, if we look back at how that's been over the last 10 years, regardless of how the technology is matured, I don't see everyone virtualizing everything all the time, right? Unless unless you guys tell me differently. That's certainly not what we see. Yeah. No, you, you're right. Um, I, I, 
and 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 I'm I'm hearing these days that uh, du during of course our conversation with customers, they are looking at a way or or, or a migration mm -hmm. path from app v to msix yeah and i think they're trying to get away from app v and 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 the new thing seems to be msix yeah so you know well, that, that seems to be a common thing of yeah. course there, right? yeah and i think I, I i'd agree with that i think the take of msix is, is probably slower than any of us would have said two three years previous um yeah I think, true, true. right yeah. i think i actually think covid's got something to do with that because i you know COVID is, you know, one of those very big events that none of us, of course, ever imagined would happen. But the impact on IT is that businesses had to really stop within a kind of month or two of going about their, their kind of transformation projects to really focus 100% on servicing their remote workforce. And companies that we're working with now on, on yeah. desktop migrations are we're probably where we should have been a kind of year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a poll out recently that I put on LinkedIn that around 70% of corporate desktops are still running Windows 10 and about 20, 20, 25% is Windows 11. And now we're talking Windows 12, right, in 2024. So, um, you know, I think um, oh, yeah. that really impacted the take up of virtualization. And MSIX, uh, as great as it is, there are some barriers to entry in terms of what you need to do to get yeah. your house in order, right, as you know. So again, I think that's that's kind of slowing the cadence slightly. Sure. Okay, um, I, I think we'll continue talking about MSX because that's yeah. one of the favorite topics. So I, I'll let well, you continue yeah. with your and, and, you know, other, other topics. I've been several of these, so. these round tables over the years and um, MSIX, I think should be a regular topic maybe because it's um, mm. it's almost considered the poor right. cousin still, right? <laughs> Um, it'd be interesting maybe next time to do a poll yeah. actually how many people are looking at MSIX because I think in the past it's, it's still the minority. Um, so there's a lot of considerations in terms of the corporate world and, you know, we touched right. on something. Yeah. Um, the, the software itself, you know, this is an age-old problem, right? Software obsolescence, version obsolescence. You know, just because there's five versions and updates of Office within a month, do you roll that out to your corporate world, right, your corporate estate? Probably not, because you're not going to have time to do all the due diligence you need to do, not just making sure that those new features are necessary and licensed, perhaps, but also that they're not going to uh, cause any impact to existing users, because nothing more more annoying than rolling out some software and you've got a degradation of functionality. And it does happen still. It really does happen, but, you know, it, it can be avoided. Um, same thing, really, around updates and patching. You know, really to a, a kind of link to the next item and the under updated software about vulnerabilities. And of course, Flexira does a lot of work in that area. But there's a lot of updates and patches that people need to manage and, and where you get those from and, you know, where where those updates and patches are sourced from yeah. is, is very important as well. So I think just uh, <laughs> to, just last couple of comments, just going back to this first, this first slide oh. here, you know, software vulnerability updates and patch profiles and risk profiles all very important right and actually just because you're not the latest version of this piece of software doesn't necessarily mean you're doing a bad thing right if it's secure and if it does what the business needs that's fantastic um so that's really one of the other considerations here yeah and that's then, that's interesting chris and maybe i can add something to it since software vulnerability management is a little bit my area of expertise exactly, here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know if you if you look at um you know if, if you look at the number of vulnerabilities that are being disclosed on a on a, a daily basis uh you know we're talking about 20,000 advice uh, sorry 20,000 CVEs being disclosed every year that's about 100 a day mm. um so if you look at that it's 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 a lot of work, right? Uh, if you look at the number of advisories that, you know, per month have unique products with a vulnerability, it's between 350 and 500 on an average, right? It's, it could, could fluctuate a little bit over the months. But, um, you know, that, that means, you know, that there's a lot of work to do. And so the importance to, you know, for, for people like, like us who are doing the patching, is, you know, what do we need to patch and what can we safely maybe ignore, right? Exactly. So it's very important to, to also 
spend the right time at the right, you know, critical patches, maybe, and leave yeah, the rest, you know, for later. Totally agree, Jerome. And, and you hit the nail on the head there, right? That just because there's an update doesn't mean you necessarily need it. Is that kind yeah, of um, maybe upset. you can skip one? Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Make, and that doesn't mean you're going to ignore it, right? I mean, to your point, all these vulnerabilities, for example, are categorized, their risk profile, they've got scores. You know, mm -hmm. because you're not going to do it right now doesn't mean you're not going to at some point. And that's back to that cadence point, right? Which we'll come on to later. Because just because a piece of software gets updated by its vendor, you know, every month, it doesn't mean that you know, big bank PLC. It's going to want to update its, its software catalog every month, right? Because the yeah. disruption to that is, is is potentially large. So, a lot of companies will have a <clears throat> a policy of just updating, you know, one or two major updates a year. The rest go into a kind of triage process, and then mm -hmm. off the side of that is the emergency security risk issues that are probably BAU for IT, right? Yeah, and, and I think that the, the, the biggest concern right now that companies have and, you know, the companies that I talk to is just the increased number of threats that are associated with the vulnerability. So, you know, a vulnerability is just a theoretical threat, so to speak, right? It's just, you know, there is a door open, but there is no hacker or there is no proof that a hacker or an exploit has been created and has been uh, deployed yet. But with uh, if you add threat intelligence to it you see that about 73 percent of all the advisories that we bring out every every month 73 percent of the vulnerabilities they have a, a threat associated with it so it becomes more and more imminent to you know to really consider you know maybe you know to add to talk really with the security team and understand you know what should we do first what is the priority here mm -hmm. yeah yeah, no, absolutely. And that, and that comes into that business transformation that... I think... That is... <clears throat> sure, go ahead. I, I think the poll results very well validate what Euron said, because we saw after uh, application owner requests, I think that was at 67%. The second one was, again, I think it was at the same percentage, 67.9% or 69 mm -hmm. rather. So. The top one is security team is pushing for update. Mm -hmm. So you're on, uh, I think you're bang on, right? So um, I think the security is getting more and more uh, uh, conscious, the teams and the organizations and, and having uh, data like advisories, threat score, all of that really helps them take those prioritization calls. Yeah, definitely. This Absolutely. is interesting, though, isn't it? The application end users, that's nearly 40%, right? That's quite high. It's a lot higher than I would have thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say with that, mm -hmm. right, some, some organizations that may not have yeah. a mature ability to, to understand vulnerability security is they may rely on their application owners. Right, that. yeah. So, the application owners are getting the note security notices right. and telling yeah. them, "Hey, you got you got to update." I'm sure there's other reasons as well that application owners there's a yeah. version that yeah. has functionality, but that might be a, a a reason that one's high as well. No, no, definitely. And yeah, there's a few other things we want to go through today, but I guess just the last thing on this point, what I found interesting again is, you know, twenty percent. So fifth is that there's a a company policy of always the latest and greatest. Um, mm -hmm. That's just, you know, that's quite low, actually. So that's quite good in that people are recognizing it's not always to get the latest version, you know, on your on your enterprise. Um, I think just clicking back to this this side here, you know, we, we've we've now kind of merged into the management topic of software end of life, you know, support considerations. Um, we talk about devices in, in in the kind of IT world of being managed or non managed, and in the world of you know corporate IT and by corporate IT, we don't necessarily mean a big company, right? But just the way they handle and manage things could be considered kind of in a corporate way. You know, with BYOD, right? There's other issues there around how do you manage the software on those devices when it's the person's device, you know, or the, the kind of employee's laptop, or how do you enforce security? How do you enforce updates on that? So these are, again, considerations. And managed versus non-managed apps, you know? The classic is that people give everybody admin rights and they install to know what they'd like. 
um, and then suddenly wonder why there's all kinds of problems. So this uh, it's all around that careful management of this. And this all needs managing, right, in order to supporting, um, especially, you know, in the world of, uh, I was thinking this morning before this, uh, before this discussion, how many apps, this could be an interesting question for another poll, how many apps does your organization have within its software estate? Um, as I said, I've spent decades helping companies around the world migrate from back in the day from Windows NT to XP, okay? Um, and more recently to Windows 10 and 11. And, and you could count the number of apps within the software estate in several thousand mm -hmm. like 20 odd years ago. But what I'm seeing is that's more like the two to 3,000 today. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, quite a big decrease, and we could have another discussion about why that is. But I think it's yeah. interesting. Um, it's an interesting direction. Could it be that software is becoming more combined, and so software is doing more together as a suite of products? Um, you know, for discussion, really. Yeah. Um, you, you might cover this later, but with such large volume of applications. Uh, how do you see organizations maintain their application repository? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because larger the number, it becomes really complicated. So yeah. do they use like file servers or do they use any systems for maintaining their repository? Uh, what's so, your general take on this one? So, you know, consistency is important. So having, you know, this is kind of to the point below, having a, a single system of record Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't have regional databases that have got complete duplication in there. Um, you know, app, app optimization, you know, um, catalog optimization and rationalization will come into in, a, in, in the next slide, I think. Um, rationalization is only useful and effective if it's done across the board and across the business, you know, be it across different geographies and definitely across different business units. And without sounding kind of... Uh, you know, too direct, I think it's just discipline, quite frankly, you know, <laughs> discipline and consistency yeah. will, will be your friend and the rest will, will be easier to manage. And therefore, you, you know, you can be true to yourself. And I think, I guess the last word to kind of help on that is just clarity and visibility. You know, it's like the classic, right? You can take this to any situation. If you don't know your current situation, how are you going to ever make it? well formed how you're ever going to solve a problem you know it's like a firefighter trucks coming to a house fire they just pull up and just pour water everywhere don't know what the fire's made from don't know what started it they're not going to do a really great job what they'll do is they'll come and they'll just quickly right <laughs> do an assessment of what the cause of the fire is what was the ignition and choose accordingly you know and i think it's the same here you know you need to take a step back as a business, look at what your application repository is representing, make sure it's representative. And really with that consistency and those rules, make it work for you to, to, to work to the future. And, you know, I, we see this quite a lot in the various parts of a business have got what they think is a true picture of what the application estate is or the, the app repository. And it's not whole, it's not the whole picture. Um, and quite often to the app rationalization that we can talk about on the next slide is actually duplicate, it's obsolete, and again, it's not telling you what the real picture is, so it's not actually that useful. So, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of food for thought in that area, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. Uh, I know we try to keep this, uh, discussions around, um, these roundtable discussions disconnected with our products, but here, uh, I couldn't stop myself, but I feel um, application, administrative application catalog could be a good place to maintain mm -hmm. or manage your application repository. Uh, mm -hmm. Like when you said system of record, I could yeah. imagine and you could immediately think application catalog, administrative catalog could be a perfect yeah, place. Yeah. I know it. Mike could have met several customers where where we have seen several thousand applications being very easily managed by the application catalog. Absolutely. And actually what, you know, again, without being too focused on that, 
what's good about that is that you can structure it to represent your business. Mm. Yeah. Um, whatever, you know, structure that needs. And you can add a whole load of metadata around that to, re to make it even closer to your business. So that wow. really can have that system of record. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, with, with, with the various data feeds, right, from the databases of, of, of known applications, um, you can make sure that's not just your own apps, but also what the other vendors are pulling in automatically to make it super. Again, it's about making it accurate, like I was saying earlier. If it's not representative, it's not going to be helpful to you. Um, and actually, just my last point on this before I move on is um, in-house apps, actually, so custom applications, every business has them, right? Um, and they're kind of almost like they're kind of not talked about, you know, because they're usually like between five and 10%, if that actually, they're usually single figure percentages. But the reason they're customized apps and they're kind of in house apps, right, is that there wasn't an off the shelf product to do what that product does. So, although these products, these apps, sorry, I should keep consistent, although these in house developed apps are a small percentage of your software estate, between five and nine percent typically. We don't often see it above 10 percent. Although they've got a small percentage of the overall number, they are super, super important. Um, and they have to be treated in a similar way in that you know what their life cycle is going to be and make sure that they're part of that picture as well. But they're more complicated mm -hmm. because they're in-house and perhaps the people who wrote them don't exist in the business anymore. Perhaps the business they came from was through M&A activity. That doesn't typically kind of have that same uh, technology anymore. But you can bet your bottom dollar that the minute you pull them out because you don't think they're being used, you're going to get a whole load of headaches. So, <laughs> um, you know, future-proofing on the last point there is really about how we use that app catalog, right, to your point, mm -hmm. uh, to monitor the usage and, and make sure it's a usable software stack. A quick uh, reminder for folks, if you do have any questions, feel free to, you should see the Q&A uh, panel um, in the um, in the webinar window, in your browser window. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. Uh, we'll, we'll go through them later. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, just, you know, we'll, we'll take it down a level into the, the, the apps, you know, themselves. We've spoken about how we manage apps, the application state, the repository, consistency with the business. One of the most common modifications to a, an app is people have put some scripting within it to do something special, something specific for their business. Um, and there's a whole wide range of those. And this isn't about this today's session isn't about how to write and install them effectively. Um, that's for another day, perhaps. But again, if we go on the four pillars here, we have a base app and there will be various reasons why, you know, you may well need to do some scripting within that. So to apply corporate standards, right? To run it with certain command line switches, to replicate some kind of legacy behavior. Perhaps again, the platform has moved on. And the, the, the classic question when I talk to enterprises about what are all these weird things doing in your install program that's caused it to, to, to cause issues, is always, it's always done that. So we've just replicated that behavior and with no other thoughts being given to it. It's kind of, you know, why are you doing it this way? Well, we've always done it this way. So there's yeah. a school of thought there to kind of questioning that as well, I think. Um, and then, on the VB script, um, yeah. you know, Microsoft recently announced that uh, they're going to deprecate VB script mm. and, and they're going to remove VB script from the future versions of Windows. So um, I would imagine the next uh, the next scripting language that the engineers or the package engineers would be looking at is PowerShell. And uh, yeah, exactly. have, you, have you seen any uh, any such conversations you having with your, with yeah, your yeah. Uh, clients? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to come back up to that actually, but yeah, as we've okay. gone down there, hundred percent. So again, if we go back, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to come and talk today is because we've been involved in this, you know, for 23, 24 years. Back in the real old days, it was JavaScript and VBScript. Those of us might remember JavaScript, right? And um, of course, that's gone through that life cycle now that it's been deprecated. There's no Java runtimes. And that was another whole headache for enterprise IT, right? Managing the whole Java runtime. Oh, glad that's over. Um, 
So yes, you know, BB scripts going the same way. It's going the same way, you know, for, the, for for all the reasons that JavaScript did. It's just it's too vulnerable now. It's too open. It's too open to you know misuse, frankly. And Microsoft, as you were saying, has now shut the door. So for the last few years, probably two or three years, we've seen kind of two camps. Some organizations are kind of, yeah, yeah, we'll deal with it when we need to deal with it kind of thing. Because oh, we're not okay. even on Windows 11 yet. To my point earlier, 25% of the enterprise on Windows 11. I'm sat there with a 70% of Windows 10 estate. It's not a big deal for me at the moment. The other school of thought is, this is coming. It's inevitable. I've got a window now to make it future-proofed and decent and well-formed. Let's get on with it before it becomes a problem. So they're the two schools. So absolutely, that's becoming more and more um, a consideration. And to your point, yeah, PowerShell is the natural rep uh, replacement for that, of course. Um, and you know, the PowerShell commandlets, right, in Admin Studio, make that super easy. It's become quite an open automation uh, standard now. I think that's fair to say that's happened a lot over the last two or three or four years. Right. I think if you were talking five years ago about PowerShell, it was a little bit of a kind of off, off topic kind of new thing that nobody really liked to touch. Um, a bit like MSIX actually still. So yeah, that's um, that's definitely where where things are heading in PowerShell. And and tools like uh, the PowerShell App Deploy toolkit. Of course, it make it a lot easier for you to look at PowerShell as a replacement. Yeah, because absolutely. now you don't have to write your entire script every time. You write it once and use the same script every time and just wrap your new applications yeah. by changing yeah. the metadata. So I, I think that way it makes it a lot easier, right? No, I 100% agree. And actually, it's mm -hmm. interesting because that's what people used to do back in the day with VB script. They'd just copy and paste it, though. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, you're right. That you know that, that toolkit makes that a lot easier, quicker and less error prone because mm. if I had a you know a pound or a dollar for every time the main cause of a problem not deploying was some embedded VB script that wasn't behaving, then you know it would be in a different situation. So yeah, you know, I don't see anything else particularly um coming against PowerShell. I think that's strengthened by those toolkits that you guys are doing and there are other ones as well, of course, freeware ones. But yeah. To the point to the point that you've got to make this stuff easy you know otherwise people aren't going to do it you know we're all busy we've all got more to do and less time um so it's all about getting it right the first time and consistency and those those powershell toolkits will definitely do that i think um, um it's interesting. yeah go ahead I was going to say, there's a question that came in. I'd be interested what you guys, if you see it uh, come up in, in any of your trainings and implementations, uh, Crispin, is um, mm -hmm. like the idea, like a package manager. So like there's the Windows package manager, WinGet, there's NuGet, there's Chocolatey, uh, there's some other ones. Do our customers, do you see them kind of utilizing that? I, I think it's traditionally been more for the development side of things to quickly pull in packages and you know, add to Visual Studio and, and, and pull it in there, but it potentially could also be used to deploy certain components and, and apps, assuming it's in the repository. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's that's definitely the way, uh, I think you, you're gonna see more and more use of that. And I think if there's, you know, like an API that clients can mm -hmm. use to, to perhaps make their own little mini toolkit, we saw that back many, many years ago where even from, again, just dipping into the product slightly, with that, with Avon Studio, there's an API for many, many years. And sometimes people would make their own little uh, product to just quickly do some things they need to do. Um, yeah. So I think that's all going in that, in that direction, definitely. Yeah. I think the Windows uh, Package Manager catalog, uh, like we talked about chocolatey, so again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm bringing in Advent Studio in this discussion because I think it's appropriate now. So we have got our own uh, patch catalog, we call it as package feed, package feed module. We have got like 6,000 plus installers at this point. Uh, now, I, I think the Windows uh, package manager is not as large as uh, the package feed. And, and my feeling is it is, uh, uh, it, it needs a little bit more of maintenance. And, and mm -hmm. uh, 
And a catalog like that will be very valuable if you have got uh, some kind of automation around it, yeah. which is which is out of the box. And today I feel there's a lot of work that you have to do on your own uh, if, if you have to take the route of uh, uh, the, the, the Windows Package Manager while uh, th there is a great amount of automation capability that admin studio adds along with the package feed where you could just subscribe packages or applications and whenever there is a new version, admin studio can automatically deploy the new version based on the automations that you have, um, that you have configured and scheduled. So I think, I, I think a catalog like those will be more, far more valuable when you have got those automation capabilities around them, which I see the package, uh, the, the Windows manager or the package manager doesn't have today. Yeah, yeah, big key is the content, right? Is if it doesn't have the content, it's that the you need. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, those some of those things are. It's real easy to write write a command and pull it down and install it, and very nice. And that's that's kind of the, the norm in the Linux world, and that's what they're trying to kind of replicate for Windows. Um, but I guess I just for me, I, I haven't seen a lot of commercial applications, you know, and, and Not, yeah. applications that end users are using. Again, it's it's been for the most part more our focus on the development side of things. So it's it's certainly a valid place to go, but I haven't seen a lot of folks using that as their primary. Right? There's still a reason there's Intune is gaining popularity and VMware Workspace One and even the good old Config Manager, um, you know, to be able to have to get from traditionally going from different vendors and grabbing their installers or like in our case with the package feed having a central place to go uh, and updating yeah. that yeah i think i think two things on that that's kind of what i was alluding to on the, on the api mentioned that people mm -hmm. tend to there are the you know the microsoft list isn't ubiquitous it's not as up to date as some would like it's a little clunky to use right just being really kind of um impartial so what I see is clients having to write their own kind of scripting and their little apps and tools to pull that data down. And then they'll also do some pulling perhaps from their um, their own repository and they'll do some logic around that to then come out with a clean list. Um, that, as you said, Mike, is, is a bit of clunky, right? And the PFM, so the Amplitude Package Feed uh, module, um, does a great job of just simplifying that, that whole thing. You know, it's, again getting that data straight in. And more importantly, as you said, in the Linux world and in the Windows admin world, if there's people on here, they'll go, yeah, we can do that. We've been doing all that stuff for decades. We don't need you. Well, yes, it's not just the getting of the data. It's knowing that data is valid and that it's tested and it's validated. That is the real power, I think, of the, of the package feed module. And we have clients really, really getting in, involved in that, definitely. That's true. We, 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 while we pull directly from the vendor, we do some vetting of ourselves before we yeah. make it available. Yeah. So we've yeah. kind of gone through that verification before we make it, um, release it out to the world. Yeah. yeah and there's a, yeah, I was going to say there's a related question. Somebody probably looked at package feed a while ago. They're like wondering if we're going to enable proactive checking of updates and, and downloading it and running it through and publishing good news. It does that today. So, um, having looked at package feed for a bit, Feel free to, to check it out again. Um, it is built in if you have Admin Studio, but don't have the package feed. There is a limited version of applications that you can run through the whole process. So you can one-off download. There's also something called the backlog where you can provide a list. Any of those that are on that list, it includes like Chrome for Enterprise and a few others. Um, you can run through the whole automation, you know, end to end with it. So um, it's a plug for that. And, and, and people can tweak that, right, Mike? They can tweak it to their needs. I think that's important. I say it's not probably a plug, but I think it's important for people to know it's it's configurable to their needs because every business is different. Yeah, just in the last release, we where before it was a single kind of workflow, so it was applied to everything app. Now you can set up multiple workflows. So if you want certain apps like MSIs, you want to be able to you know take as is, but EXEs, you want to put a PowerShell app deploy toolkit wrapper around it and segment those out. Now you can set up multiple different workflows and for each application you add to this backlog list, you can choose which workflow you want to apply. So that's new. Yeah. yeah. I think just, just tying up this topic here of scripting, you know, um, scripting's great, it's got a purpose, but we should always you know, think about what is the native route. You know, we don't want to go off road on any technology we use because the minute you go off road, you've got to think about things like dependencies, is it secure? Yeah. 
is it going to flip out at an, at an exception when it's deployed in a situation like a virtualization, a virtualized environment that doesn't yes. expect? And, um, you know, the future proofing of what you're doing, you may well have something that works today for this specific environment, but to Kieran's point earlier in terms of virtualization, it's only going to increase, right, the, the amount of virtualization people do um, as technology improves and accessibility that improves. So, you know, the less you've got that's custom and bespoke, then the less you're going to have to manage. And the less you've got, you know, you, you, the less you've got to go wrong, quite frankly, the less you've got to test. So if you can pull down a package from, you know, something like a package speed module that's already done and dusted, maybe you'll do some kind of standard transformation of that to make it look and feel how your business needs, then that's much, much more preferable to creating a bunch of bizarre scripts, all be them in PowerShell, that are gonna do a bunch of stuff and then have to undo a bunch of stuff. Um, keep it simple, right? That's, that's definitely what we see. I think if we press forward, uh, there's another poll, right? Should we go to the next poll? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So. Uh, they might be uh, like the previous one. I think we kind of intended it to be more of a uh, select one, but you may be able to select multiple. But uh, so if that's the case, uh, feel free. But yeah, we wanted to un kind of understand, you know, as, as uh, Crispin mentioned before, right now, majority are on still on Windows 10. There's some that have adopted Windows 11. Windows 12 has kind of been teased to come out uh, next year. So what do you, what are, we just kind of wanted to see what the audience has seen in terms of, what your plans are basically no we're fully on windows 10 no no current plans obviously it'll, it'll change in the future but as, at the moment what's your you know current thinking have you started rolling out windows 11 you know say net, as new pcs come out you know folks get windows 11 kind of waiting to see i think we're all probably waiting to see for windows 12 you know what that looks like mm -hmm. um and then chris you said some folks have kind of a regular cadence right yeah so the, the fourth item d on there um you know, we, we, we see several clients, we've seen several clients over the last few years who have a very set corporate cadence mm -hmm. as to what they do. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could say, well, that's really kind of, that's too regimented. What happens if Microsoft do something amazing on year three and you're not going to take advantage of it? Fine, good point. But actually, this is more about protecting the business from a disruptive, you know, the upheaval of trying to do something too quickly that's not tested. You now, we've all, yeah. all had the situations where, you know, my computer's running Windows 10. Why do I need to go to Windows 11? Yeah, we're all techies, right? We love technology. I want to have the Windows 11. I want to have Windows 12. But mm -hmm. in the business world, you know, mm -hmm. what is the advantage of doing that? And also, mm -hmm. what is the disadvantage? So what am I setting the business up for? If I try and be too bleeding edge, and you may well have pockets. You will have pockets of the business that so you kind of nominate to run a pilot. Of course, that's very normal. It's nothing innovative, right? It's nothing innovative. We do, but you know, I see customers saying, "No, no, no." The corporate estate is every three years or every five years, and we uh -huh. may well have pockets of pilots for a particular innovative, you know, user group. Um, that, that's you know, with, with all the usual things, right? They're open to change. They are not business critical, but there's always a backup that if we do do a, a pilot to them, then we know we can roll it back in some way and keep the business continuity going. So it's oh. really, yeah, but but with Microsoft uh, reducing or shortening the life cycle for each operating system, mm -hmm. back in the day during the Windows ten, uh, sorry Windows seven days, uh, uh, it would take more than five years for a version mm -hmm. of operating system to go end of life. But with Windows ten, I think they've brought it down to eighteen months. In eighteen months, mm -hmm. they will stop the servicing. So I think somewhere organizations, though they want to stick to a uh, version, I think they get into a situation where they have to move to the next version, let's say within Windows 10 or to Windows 11 or maybe in the future Windows 12. Yeah. So they keep continuously getting those security updates. Now there mm -hmm. is again um, a specific long-term channel that Microsoft has, they call it as LTSC long-term service channel or something, which I think mm -hmm. has got a validity of five or 10 years. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure remember the exact timeline. 
maybe yeah. those are the those are the versions where you want to have your mission critical machines uh, have those LTSC uh, version of operating system, so you don't have to worry about updating those for really really long term. Yeah, yeah, those are the shop four machines. Those are the ATMs. Those are uh, the things you don't want to. ATMs, wanna... yeah. Absolutely. Once it's yeah. working, I don't want to touch it until I absolutely have to. So. Absolutely. Well, yeah. at least, yeah. But for the desktop world, right, they were pushing for a while, Microsoft, two feature updates per year. And yeah. they toned that down. Um, they toned it down, down yes. Yeah. yeah. And even Apple, too, they've kind of separated security updates. So they still roll it in, but sometimes you can have a security update separate from feature update if you're not ready to jump to the feature capabilities. You can still stay secure because they know. I, they don't want their operating system to be a, a vector of, you know, of, of spreading malware and, and so forth. So, yeah, that's our, that right. separation makes it more manageable, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so you can definitely take the security updates and the feature updates, yeah. maybe. Yeah. I, I think I remember early Windows 11, right? It was Microsoft's like, no, we're going to move the start menu. We're going to kind yeah. of rigidize it. And this is the way you're going to use it. And folks like, yeah. I hate this. I don't like this. So yeah. businesses don't want to, they don't want to introduce change, right? Most in, they just want their end users to keep doing, maybe it looks a little different, but I can still, my workflow is is yeah. not considerably altered. And, and so that's why I think they typically don't jump on a new version immediately. Let's wait and see. You know, back yeah, yeah. in the day was the first service pack, or now it's the it's the next feature, you know, channel release, and and see how it goes first. And and also, you know, to, to Kieran's point as well about the long term serviceability part of packages from Microsoft. But there's also, you know, we all know that you can pay a certain amount of money to get extended support from Microsoft. That's not a new thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. some businesses kind of go, well, I'm just going to pay this dollar amount, and that removes my problem. You know, until they get to the next gate post when that's another two years. And what you'll see Microsoft doing quite rightly is they're not notching up the cost of doing that. So there's uh -huh. going to be a balance where actually it's not actually that cost effective now just to pay the bill to get extended support. It's actually going to be uh -huh. easier and quicker just to bring them up to a point here and pull them, pull them out of Windows 10, you know, into, into 12. And, you know, I guess we'll look at the poll in a second. But traditionally, you know, one of the points of earlier is that, that companies will skip platforms, you know, because mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anybody on Windows XP, but I bet there is. I bet there's some computers somewhere in, in banks that are doing important stuff. You know, I was at an airport many, about, only about five years ago with a, a, a boarding pass scanning machine with a small five-inch display on it, right, with a Windows XP embedded thing. Wow. It did crash, yeah. unfortunately, but <laughs> um, and med medical scanners, right? It to work with, um, I won't say who, but no, airline companies. And the cadence of, of what they do is even longer, right? A project to build an airplane is 10 years long, and they're not going to change anything, you know, to, to, mm -hmm. just to pacify an update. Hey, let's look at the poll, shall we? Let's see what it's saying. Yeah. Um, sure. So yeah, great, great. A lot of people moving to Windows 11, brilliant. Um, and yeah, Windows 10 is, is 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 kind of the minority. And I think that's that's good news, right? I think that's good news for the world of enterprise IT for all the reasons of security and vulnerability management and, and moving forward. Um, Twelve and a half percent do that regular. Yeah. Updates, which is kind of what I'd expect actually. Um, did we get any? Is, was there the ability in the poll to put any text on the other unknown, or is it just other unknown? Well, it's, you know, feel free if, if the, for the folks that put the unknown or other, um, feel free to put it just, you know, a couple words in the q and doesn't have to be a question uh, if you have any specific reasoning around it. But um, yeah. Yeah, that's not insignificant, right? That's 12.5%. That's, you know, it's not like it's 1%. Um, interesting. And then yeah. waited for Windows 12. So, um, yeah, watch his space, I guess, on that one, right? Yeah. yeah it's interesting to see there is no much curiosity around Windows 12. No. 4.2 is, yeah. It well, probably <laughs> is, but, you know, it, it, it's probably also is, you've also kind of, like we've been talking, you can't necessarily just stay still and, and wait for, for what's coming, so. Correct, Everyone, yeah. Everyone's busy doing Windows 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, clearly. Right. Cool. Yeah, okay. 
And really just my kind of, my last slide is, is really to that point about lessons learned from the past. So we joked at the, at the beginning of the call that you know, my experience in doing application packaging precedes platforms and products like Avon Studio. You know, I think I used Avon Studio 1.0, right, back in 2001. And, uh, but, you know, packaging existed before that, right? The, the, the concept of packaging and application packaging existed in NT4. Uh, just it was a lot more manual, a lot more work to do, and there was a different tool set. So there's a lot of lessons, that, there's a lot of common threads and veins of veins of standardization we see from the late 90s right through to now to 2023, 24. Um, the point we were talking earlier about the update cadence for the corporate business is different to the vendor. And I think that's getting more and more um, close and it's getting, I think it's getting easier to manage with the things like the, you know, the package key module. Um, but I think a lot of companies now are just blindly taking updates whenever they come out, they're just applying their corporate standard to that. And then we were talking earlier about rationalization right, of this app repository. Think of the application repository as, as, as living, right, needing maintaining. Sorry, that I've definitely heard, yeah, I, I was saying that I've definitely heard from many of our customers during our conversations that, oh, oh we want to be always on the latest. Mm. And, and that's where I think uh, to your point where the vendor cadence is getting closer to the corporate cadence. I think that absolutely makes sense. And, and I'm, I'm seeing that also in, in many of our customer, mm. uh, customers environments that whenever there is a new version released by the vendor, they want to be on the latest version as soon as possible. Yeah, and I think there's two, two additional quick comments on that. One is quite often vendors are tying the fact they need to be on the latest couple of versions to their support plans. So if you call up, you know, with a problem and you're wording seven versions old, that you're likely going to be told, get the latest and greatest and call me back. <laughs> um, I think that's because there's been so much technological change over the last several years, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the other yeah. interesting point on that is, you know, what is the what is the, the app we're talking about? I think there's a big difference between swapping out a database client like Oracle, right? Other databases are available, um, or SQL Server. Swapping that client out, which is going to be very important oh, yeah. for several pieces of the business, to swapping out, you know, Office or uh, you know, PowerPoint, you know, sorry, Photoshop or something. So, completely agree with you, you know, in, in that getting that sense. Yeah. But I think for the real important stuff, I think it's still a business criticality decision. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and we spoke about enterprises skipping releases. It's great that number was it seventy percent that we're going looking at actively going to seventy one. Yeah, going to Windows eleven. That's fantastic. Now we all know that that is going to be a six, nine, twelve month project, right? In 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 in, in a big business, quite easily. So. Um, that's a good question we should maybe use on not the next one, I think the date will be announced at the end of this session, but I think maybe even this time next year, we should just see what that's looking like and it'd be interesting to see. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, the, the, the same core rules apply, right? Be smart about this app repository. You know, it can be your friend, but only if you allow it to be by being consistent and making sure it's well formed and it's got the right data in. Deployment, we haven't spoken a lot about deployment today because I think it probably warrants its own topic, actually. Um, yeah. it's, a bit, it's a minefield, right? But, you know, again, this is about lessons learned. If we go back 20 years, it's pretty much active directory, right, or nothing, you know? Oh, yeah. And the world, was, the world was simpler. So, you know, there's lots of options now in the deployment world, and they've got their own nuances as well, and they've got their own problems. So. Um, and then you sprinkle in the the concept of, of app virtualization into that. So I think that's probably one for another session. Be mindful of how applications are used. It sounds really straightforward, but I talk to clients a lot of the time. And a little bit to the point earlier, how an app is used will de define its importance in your projects and in your off migrations. As I said earlier about Oracle client, you know, for example, that will have a very different cadence to an in-house app or to office or something like that. And um, really just make this dynamic. And I think Kieran, to your point earlier about how the companies do this, you've got to have that single source of the truth, right? The application mm -hmm. Studio is, is 
is fantastic as long as it's well formed and as long as the data that's in there is, is reliable. And there'll always be a hybrid of how that is kept reliable through package feed module, through manual scripting, through it being someone's responsibility as well. And um, I think nowadays, a lot of companies have been through the, the pipe of going to Windows 7 probably, and now they're going to Windows 11 and they can pick up those lessons learned, right? And, and avoid the pains of before. And again, the, the, the software that we're using, the, the scripting, like the PowerShell, you know, the, the, the packages around PowerShell, the commandlets, the backlog functionality that Mike, you were talking about, all just makes that a lot easier for everybody. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, this, this, this probably isn't, and probably people aren't gonna go, oh, wow, this is revelationary. But I think hopefully it'll be all familiar and people will be, oh yeah, yeah, these, these are the things we know we'll be doing. And oh yeah, no, actually you're right. We're doing it right. And I think that's fantastic. Um, I'll pause there. I'll pause there on my side. Um, I think Mike, do you have anything from the, the Q and A slide? Well, uh, their question came in. They wanted to get your opinion. We've kind of talked internally on what potential things there are, but AI being a uh, very buzzy, Topic of late, do you see AI potentially in helping with application packaging, preparation, deployment? Yeah, I, I think AI has got to place, I think a couple of things have got to happen before AI becomes useful in our world. I think mm -hmm. if AI can feedback how an app is used within an, within an enterprise, and if AI can essentially kind of scan the, um, the repository, whatever that is, right, scan it for inconsistencies and scan it for kind of mismatches and you kind of the concept in our, my head would be have some kind of business rules that you can apply to make what you do today easier quicker and more consistent i think that's where ai can play a part i think the world's getting very excited about ai i think if any of you any of us have used it it's um it's in its infancy although um you know, there was a discussion a couple of weeks ago, Elon Musk was here in the UK and he deemed that none of us are going to have jobs, right, in the future, because they're always going to do everything well. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case, but um, yeah, I think, you know, AI is a brilliant tool, it's a brilliant concept for doing very detailed, very consistent work, very reliably. Uh -huh. And I think they're the two areas. So helping the business understand how an app is really used. Because you know, when you deploy an app from, you know, from your repository, you've done all the checks and balances and off it goes to be deployed it, with whatever system you use, right? It's kind of, to some degree, it's a fire and forget scenario. You know, yes, there are ways that you can tell it was deployed successfully and you know, Microsoft Endpoint Management will do that, right? No problem. You can say it was deployed 1500 times and these are the machine names, these are the times. And that's kind of where the visibility stops. So if there's a kind of way we can get some kind of intelligence around how the app is really being used, that I think will feed into the business to say, well, actually, do we need all these versions of this product? Or do we need this product at all? And the way we do that today is quite manual, right? We go around asking application owners. We might talk to the finance teams, oh, how many licenses this do we have? Oh, we have 20. Oh, interesting. It's only deployed twice. So. I think it can really help in that kind of visibility aspect of what we do. And why is that good? It's good because it'll help us to focus on the areas that need our focus. And again, to the point I made earlier, you know, we're all being asked and told to do uh, more with less. And I think that kind yeah. of direction can be helped. Yeah. Yeah, that visibility that, you spoke that could of. Be being interesting. Able to be able to rationalize it and understand it. That's. That's getting into our uh, our other side of Flexera and uh, yeah. capability yeah. and helping enterprises. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that all feeds back eventually. But that to the could be a good topic, package. right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. AI and application packaging could be a good topic for one of our roundtables in the future. Uh, for one way I can think uh, AI can really help you at this point from a packaging point of view is. Mm. Uh, we know that package engineers may not have or immediately may not come with a lot of scripting or programming uh, knowledge or mm -hmm. skill set. Mm -hmm. So AI can be definitely used okay. if you want some ready-made scripts right away quickly, which you could use for, yeah. let's say, your yeah. small yeah. tasks related to packaging. 
cleaning yeah. up registries or anything like that, right? So it's yeah. a lot easier to get those scripts ready you know, using AI. That could be a very quick benefit that I can get in the yeah. packaging world from AI. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, I think we're up on time, uh, but thanks. So I appreciate everyone uh, joining today. Crispin, thanks for joining us as our guest. And um, um, feel free to check out our community. Uh, we've got a lot of good topics. Um, there's an active forum there. You can get documentation. There is an, also an article ar around TLUX introducing them. So if you need training, mentoring, health check type of things, they're definitely our trusted partner to uh, help you provide there. So have an active blog every time there's a new release of admin studio uh, Kieran has a great write-up on what new capabilities are how it's valuable it's learning center with different videos for self-guided uh, enablement uh, is there and lots of other cool videos that we've put out over time including some scripting powershell other capabilities so check that out and then uh, always open to hear what we want to talk about we want to we want topics that are relevant for the audience here so if you have anything, it's quite a long URL, but you can also search for it. Uh, it's, a, it's part of our community um, in the forums. We have a post, so if you have any topics you'd like discussed, happy to do that. Um, so that's that. Uh, and then appreciate it. We'll have another one probably with the February uh, time period. So we'll take a break for the holidays and new year. Hope you all have a wonderful um, end of the year uh, season. Uh, and we'll uh, see you and talk to you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.